A woman came up to me the other day and she actually walked up and said, oh, I can't wait to read your book. And I said, why is that? And she said, for all the great travel tips of traveling with children. And I, was, I had this instant vision of my daughter Jamie in the uh, uh, Dajar Al Fanar or whatever it was called, the town centre of Marrakesh, sitting there in, with a fire in front of her and a dude in a, in a robe and a fez hat playing the flute. She's got two snakes around her neck, she's holding three others and she's got a cobra just swaying in front of her face. I'm thinking this ain't the book for you. The book, On the Road with Kids, as some of you already know, as most of you know, the book's about the year that um, uh, Mandy and I ended up chucking in our careers and uh, buying an old camper, packing up the two kiddies aged four and two, and taking off for a year around Europe. And um, as, as sensational as that setting was, from 30 countries from uh, Europe to um, the North Pole and Africa and Asia and back, it actually became more, uh, that became more the background to the story that was going on inside the van, how we were evolving as a family and changing our thought processes from probably the more traditional work orientated where we started from. Um, <coughs> why we did it, um, we, I've been asked that a number of times and uh, it, it's a, a dangerous period of thinking started when I was, um, uh, I burst two discs in my back and so I spent six weeks in uh, sucking down Valium pills and staring at the ceiling and starting to wonder if this is it. And then um, uh, it sort of dawned on me with a big clap of thunder one day in a boardroom meeting when everyone was talking about very important stuff and I wasn't listening. I was, I was actually sitting there thinking about how I'd been working for the last close to a decade. Um, my work life had become my social life and vice versa. Uh, my kids had turned four and two and I'd hardly noticed that. So I was the archetypical corporate guy who just had, wasn't there. And I realised that something had to change, my priorities. And so in that moment, it was the moment, I do recall when the chairman turned and asked me a question and I couldn't even be bothered answering him, that it was the moment for my working life, so clear in my memory that I no longer gave a hoot. Different word in the book. <laughs> But um, rather than talk about the trip, I thought I'd uh, give you a bit of an insight into why and how I actually wrote the book. Um, w when we were travelling, and whenever I've ever travelled, I've uh, written these long pages, uh, letters home, 20, 30, 40 pages of rolling crap in various states of uh, sobriety, always to my mother. And um, I did that again on this trip because we were disconnected from internet and everything else, so there's not a lot to do at night in the camper writing, writing, writing. And on return, I came home and visited my mother at Ballycara Retirement Village down at Redcliffe. And when I got there, there was all these, uh, her friends, Doris, Olive, Joy, and all these women <laughs> who knew more about me than I did. And apparently in this year away, as my letters were landing, they were waiting by the post box and they'd sit around them like a campfire laughing and carrying on like this. So I get there and they're saying, t they're saying to me, oh my God, we, we couldn't get over what, what happened with the peacocks. Uh, and that reminded me because my, my son Callum was two years old and he had a distinctive two-year-old scream at the time which the peacocks interpreted, this was in Marrakesh, as a, as a mating cry and so they all started surrounding him. <laughs> Fortunately the peacocks didn't get their way so it didn't end out too bad. But um, uh, they then asked, you know, did Jamie, how did Jamie get over her accident and did Mandy ever forgive me for what happened on the rock of Gibraltar? So they're asking me all these questions but most disconcerting of all um, was that I'd written a lot of raw thoughts about other things that happened on the trip like visiting Gallipoli and visiting Auschwitz and places like that. And so these women knew a bit more about me than I actually wanted. Combining their interest at the same time, we'd made a few seismic changes to our life since we came back. And um, a lot of people were showing interest in that. So with a group of women in a retirement village, when they tell you you have to write a book, you don't have a lot of choice. <laughs> Um, but um, armed with, the, so I started the writing and armed with these letters that I'd sent home that my mother had kept, they were the best bar diary notes I could have ever hoped for because they were written in the now with no thought process of actually what I was trying to write. So it took me right back to all these weird and wonderful moments. And so I, I, uh, I used them and I started writing and my wife being a writer, I'd, I'd be writing drafts and she'd be saying to me, it's a bit boring, you've got to tell us, <laughs> how did you feel? How did you feel? 
And I'm looking at her going, I feel like you stopped telling you to stop asking me how I feel. <laughs> so three years of scribbling away in the back room and wondering whether, whether I'd turn into a hermit and 180,000 words of crap wrote, slammed down. I didn't really tell too many people I was writing a book because people look at you strangely when you say that. And um, I did feel a bit like a fraud, you know, who was I to be a writer? Um, and so um, it was more a bit of a hobby. Um, but I kept going for two main reasons. Um, one was I actually, again, just like when I was travelling and sitting on the buses and writing, 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 I actually loved the process of writing. I got lost in it, so I actually enjoyed it. And um, the second thing which kept pushing me on was I felt that I was, I actually felt I had a bit of a message to, to say in the, in the story. And so the vision of delivering that message and sharing it kept pushing me because I had felt that I'd wasted chunks of my life uh, when I could have used it could have used it better and what happened to me with the back or whatever was a wake up call and so it became a, a more of a message to share there. And um, when we actually went to Turin, um, we vis visited some friends and we'd been on the road by then by about four months and um, when we stayed with them, their names were Luca Marina and Guillermo, um, they were on, they was like looking into a mirror. He was working the 15 hour days and da da and she was juggling the, the, the kitty and the work life as well. And this is what I wrote um, from that little visit in observation of where the mind had changed a little bit. I observed our friends daily routines from a curious distance. Luca would arrive home after work late each night while Marina juggled her own job and Ghoulie's needs. What gripped me was that their lifestyle mirrored our recent former life and exposed it as the complete opposite of the magic zone that we'd fallen into. It seemed as though in our thirties we become responsible because having big debts and crying babies is serious. We further complicate things by clamping on balls and chains to our aspirations and freedom in the form of big loans for unneeded things. And then we row hard in the bowels of the slave ship, doing lots of stuff we don't want to, dreaming of the day when we can afford to do what we really want to do, and when that day comes, we wonder why we didn't wake up to the fact that life is short and that we should have chased our real dreams earlier. So that was our, the thought process after that, that uh, visit. So the book was born. And, and the book says, um, no turning back on the front cover. And, and, and previously, before we went travelling, we'd been living on this mad speeding freight train of life and um, we certainly slowed down but one thing we realised was when we came back our big challenge was how can we retain this uh, bubble of connectedness that we'd actually achieved after a year on the road uh, together and so when we came back we had to start to work out what we were going to do and we, and we did embrace an awful lot of the lessons from that time out, the power of time out is just extraordinary and we remember, remember meeting this guy camping on the west coast of Portugal, this surfer dude who'd bought the, the V-dub and he had his four kids wedged in the back, sold his house and I said, asked him, you know, mate, mate, what do people think of this? And he goes, man, he says, just because you have kids doesn't mean you have to give up your own life. And so I did embrace that idea and, um, <laughs> and there was another guy we met on the Camino um, in Spain, the, uh, the Way of St. James walking across uh, to Santiago de Compostela and he was telling us about the pilgrimage of your walk the 500 miles because it's the biggest Christian pilgrimage walk in the world since year 1000. And he was talking about the whole idea of the fact that when you take two, three, four months or longer out of your life, you have a chance to look inwards at what you want to do or what you want to achieve and how you end up returning back to the place you started but you see everything with new eyes. So we love that idea. So when we did return back, the one thing that we're very aware of was that ultimately it doesn't matter you know, whether you're 25, 45 or 75, life is absurdly short in, in, and we don't need a wake-up call, we should wake up earlier. And, and so rather than filling it with the crap that I had been in the wasted times, it was more about focusing on the stuff that might make your heart thump a bit more. And so the call to action um, was really the one because after all, you know, we're not here for a practice run. The book wouldn't exist without Mandy and, and, and because she was a writer, I, it was like having on call an editor. 
The only problem was that I'd also done a lot of assessing of her work over the years. <laughs> so she remembered the time that she'd given me a draft and I handed it back to her with a note on it saying, don't hand me this first draft crap. <laughs> so six years later, that came back, but then there was an even harsher one she gave to me once, and it was just one word. She'd scrawled across the entire page and it said, yawn. <laughs> <laughs> so every writer needs a brutal editor. Maybe, maybe not that brutal. Um, but um, she also reckons that uh, in chap parts of this book, I've written it to make me sound like the superhero and her sound like my sidekick chump. And, and so I thought I'd just finish by reading a section out of the book and you guys can make your own call on what, what you reckon on that theory. <coughs> I'd always thought of uh, monkeys as cute fluffy little things, a, t a type of koala. But the ones that patrolled the summit of the rock of Gibraltar were not cute at all. These guys had bloodshot eyes, long fangs, and wandered around as though they were between rounds in a fight club. Look at the monkeys, Callum pointed. I dragged my eyes away from the glistening blue water stretching along the rugged Spanish coastline. They're actually Barbary macaques, matey. Callum frowned. He was going through a stage in which he would adamantly correct any grammar that didn't align with his reality. Not Barbie marks, monkeys, he yelled. I held up my hands, having learnt not to argue with this potential scream bubble when he entered his pernickety mode. OK, monkeys then, just chill out, man. I turned away and whispered Barbary macaques to myself in some form of personal linguistic victory over my infant son. <laughs> I think he's hungry, Mandy suggested. Can you get his Vegemite sandwich out of my day pack? Mandy turned with the pack still on her back. I ferreted away, rustling noisily through various plastic bags. Daddy, Callum cried out. Shush, mate, I'm getting it. Wait. Digging through my wife's assorted bags was like reaching into the junk section of a kleptomaniac's purse. <laughs> if you hadn't packed so much, sh I heard a hiss and looked up to see a tooth-bearing ape soaring through the air towards us. Instantly, I reacted to this danger to my wife with the instincts of a special agent protecting the president. <laughs> I lurched out of the way squealing. <laughs> The ape landed on Mandy's back. <laughs> Sorry, I always giggle when I get to this bit. <laughs> she launched into a frenzied screaming spin. It was then I saw the large red lettered sign on the fence. Beware, apes associate plastic bags with food and will snatch. The macaque clung on, grabbing Mandy's hair with one hand like he was riding a rodeo bull and tearing inside the pack with the other. As Mandy, the human spinning top, increased her velocity, I tried valiantly not to laugh. The ape eventually ripped the plastic bag out and vaulted over the fence. Mandy threw the day pack off like it was a strap-on bomb and hurtled into the nearby cafe. The macaque sat down on a stony outcrop and slowly, tauntingly picked his way through the prize. Callum was apoplectically distraught having never seen his mother attacked by a wild animal before. <laughs> daddy, daddy, tears sprayed from his eyes. It's okay, Callum. I knelt and cuddled him, still trying to harness my inappropriate convulsions of laughter. <laughs> Mummy's safe now. But daddy, he screamed louder than ever. A monkey took my sandwich. <laughs> <laughs>See the picture, Mandy's behind the wheel. <laughs> because I had a dodgy back, when we got there, my dream was to drive the vehicle. But I, with my back, I instantly found, because it was a big old clutch like that with the thing, I couldn't drive. So Mandy became the driver and I became the navigator. And I learnt on the mountains of Norway, it doesn't matter whether you're looking down a 1,000 foot drop with ice on the side or not, it's just not appropriate for a husband to give driving advice to a wife. <laughs>